Hi, my name is Alan Evans. It's a pleasure to be here in these very, very strange times. I'm going to be talking about brain mapping, past, present, and future. I hope that uh, when we uh, do meet in person, it'll be a little bit something like this. So I'll be talking about brain mapping. I've divided the evolution of the, of the field into roughly three epochs, uh, the past from 1975 to 1995, and then the present up until about 2015. And I'd like to think that what's going on right now from the, about the last five years is uh, both somewhat of the uh, present, but also of the future. So I'm going to uh, split it up in that manner. Basically, this, this uh, worldview, we see that uh, in the 70s, we had the arrival of the new technologies, PET and MRI, and indeed X-ray, CT. They were all invented in the 70s. In the 80s, there was a much greater emphasis on analysis. And of course, in the 90s, we saw the uh, introduction of fMRI, functional MRI. Of course, all this was taking place uh, at a time when uh, radiologists were not at all uh, uh, receptive to the idea of computer scientists, mathematicians invading their space. I'm not quite sure they understood the need for what we were doing. We started to do quantitative radiology, if you like, quantitative neuroimaging. And here is an example where we uh, would take, say, three uh, T1, T2 proton density MRI images and use some form of uh, k-means clustering, some uh, uh, classification approach to identify three tissue classes, gray, white, and CSF. Of course, you can extend this principle to any number of classes and any number of, of uh, input images. So here you have uh, four input images, seven classes showing a glioblastoma. But these were individual quantitative images. Uh, it's not what I would call uh, brain mapping. And brain mapping conceptually started uh, in the 40s when Penfield was stimulating the exposed cortex of indigent patients to uh, identify uh, functional neuroanatomy, whether it was olfaction or motor areas in the brain uh, or identified by direct stimulation. So we moved forward to the, uh, the late 80s and early 90s, and we start to see the rise of functional activation, whether it was be using uh, positron tomography or functional MRI to, to uh, reveal the functional neuroanatomy of the brain in normal uh, volunteers. And this allowed us to map out the, the entire brain. Now these were fine, but the really, what really motivated the arrival of this whole new field of cognitive neuroimaging was the our introduction of stereotactic space, which is, in theory, a, a rather a trivial concept of, of uh, mapping everybody's three-dimensional brain image into a common coordinate space, into a three-dimensional three box, but it has had profound implications. Labs around the world can repeat experiments and compare results directly. Raw image data and process maps are readily shared amongst labs. Results are reproducible. Networks of labs can share data and algorithms Data repositories for global scientific communities can be placed on the web. New questions can be asked long after the primary research is completed and new or improved algorithms can easily be applied to old questions. And most importantly, I think the, this principle of stereotactic space is adaptable to any species, imaging mod modality or organ. So we now have all of the data mapped into a common 3D coordinate space allows us all kinds of statistical approaches. Uh, Carl Friston, one of the giants in the field, introduced the statistical parametric mapping or SPM approach, which allowed us to quantify uh, the statistical uh, significance of any brain regional activation. Also around this time, uh, my dear friend Keith Worsley introduced random field theory. And this gave us the concepts of uh, resols or resolution elements and uh, connectivity, the statistical 
mapping of um, interconnectivity between brain regions. And I urge those of you who, who are not familiar with the, these works to really dig deep and explore the, the, the beautiful elegance of uh, this mathematical formalism that uh, uh, Keith Worsley introduced. Also in the 90s, uh, ICBM, the International Consortium for Brain Mapping, started to uh, explore the idea of probabilistic neural anatomy and apply the same statistical parametric approaches to anatomy rather than functional activation. And this gave us uh, the ideas which are expressed here in, in a later work, but the ideas are very much the same, of uh, probabilistic tissue maps for gray matter, white matter, CSF, whether they be in, in children on the left or in uh, adults on the right. One of the things I think it's worth mentioning is what once you uh, get into statistical analysis, quantitative neuroimaging, then you have to deal with many, many different forms of uh, artifact. And this is one which is commonly affects any attempt to classify imaging data into tissue classes as um, non-MRI intensity, non-uniformity. And so this shows the uh, result on the left, uh, the, the data before processing and removal of this MRI intensity, non-uniformity, and the results on the right, which gives a much more uh, uh, homogeneous uh, distribution of intensities for each of the three classes. This is uh, essentially uh, maximizing the entropy of the intens intensity histogram so that we have three distinct classes which can be uh, identified. It's a fully automated approach and it's widely used around the world. So as you can see here, we started in 1992, we averaged uh, 305 brains together, very fuzzy, and you see various uh, versions of this approach as we go forward to uh, allow us to get a sharper and sharper definition of the individual brains. Now this raises the issue of what is the right level of sharpness and this graph essentially summarizes uh, the situation where we can have either a rigid body uh, mapping from a native space into a stereotactic space which doesn't take into account scale, or we can go through various uh, higher dimensions of linear and affine uh, transformation. Ultimately, we can uh, see the, uh, the very high dimensional with perhaps a, a million or more parameters, which allow us to get uh, very, very individualized, uh, high resolution, non-linear mapping uh, across brains into a common coordinate space problem that we have, of course, is that all brains are not diffeomorphic. They, they are not uh, mappable under a simple um, uh, transformation. So in this, in this uh, simple example, subject A has a particular sulcus, subject B has the same sulcus, but it's longer. So where do we map the bottom end of, the, of subject A's sulcus? to the uh, approximately the same length on the other sulcus of subject B or to the far end. So this correspondence problem bedevils all of our brain mapping. We don't know exactly what is corresponding between two points into any two brains. A very specific example of this problem is shown here with Heschel's gyrus, which can have either a single gyrus or two gyri or somewhere in between. And so at the end of the day, um, uh, mathematical models which are closed form and, and uh, clean and elegant do crash on the rocks of uh, non-diffeomorphism across brains. So numerical approaches which do uh, alignment are uh, just as justifiable as, as um, uh, closed form um, mathematical transformations because non-diffeomorphism is, uh, is a reality that we have to struggle with. So this brings up the idea of what is noise and what is signal. The, we can uh, go to the right of this graph and take uh, ever stronger alignment, ever smaller anatomical details to get higher. We require higher quality data, more powerful algorithms and faster computers. But um, we still have to decide uh, what is signal and what is noise. We can, we can force 
a, a um, Tiger to map into a 1957 Chevy, what does it, what, what does it achieve? So at the end of the day, there is no right answer to what is the proper level of, of uh, spatial normalization that one should adopt. It depends on the question you're asking. And on the left of this graph, you see that uh, weaker alignment is fine for functional imaging because functional data and structural data are, um, are not directly linked. There is some degree of slot between the anatomy and the function. So um, if you're using an anatomical data to align brains so you can get better functional activation, at some point it's not worth it because the, the, uh, the structure and function are not perfectly aligned. So you don't get any benefit from high resolution alignment. This is a, a more recent version of the MNI 152 Atlas, uh, 40th generation. Shows a lot of detail. Um, very nice picture. Of course, this probabilistic anatomy is a, a, applicable in uh, disease as well as in normal brain development. So you, hear, you see here uh, three different uh, normal tissue classes and the red on the left shows you the uh, location of multiple sclerosis lesions. Um, mapping into stereotactic space, we can uh, identify uh, in this case 460 subjects to give a probabilistic distribution of the MS lesions. And we can, of course, visualize that in 3D, which is very nice. So the, the green stuff is the probabilistic distribution of MS lesions across a population of 460 subjects. And this kind of approach then allows us to, to do fully automated analysis of the impact of various drug interventions, for instance, to see how we, the, uh, the drug interferes and changes the distribution of the green stuff. So we can, we can be, uh, apply statistical approaches to the drug trials. Put this slide in just to remind myself that the um, notion of probabilistic neuroanatomy or probabilistic function is, is certainly not restricted to brain. And here's an example from Vladimir Bonov and uh, Julian Cohen et al, which uh, showed a probabilistic spinal cord and of course you can do the same kind of statistical analysis and outlier detection uh, in, in the spinal cord as one can do in the brain. If you want to find out more about brain templates and atlases you can go to this review that was written in 2012 so somewhat out of date but it covers the, uh, the uh, some of the historical underpinnings of uh, brain mapping. So move to the present. I'll talk a little bit about two uh, elements of, of uh, the present, structural and functional. Um, we saw the introduction of FreeSurfer, which is a, a tool for extracting the cortical brain sur surfaces. At the same time, uh, our own civet was also being developed, which does much the same sort of thing, extracts the three-dimensional cortical surfaces. You see here, basically, uh, uh, finite element mesh modeling to fit to various uh, uh, features around the cortical surface, extracting both inner and outer boundaries of the uh, cortex so we can get vertex-wise mapping of cortical thickness. This can be applied in many different settings. An example here from 200 uh, patients showed the uh, delayed maturation of uh, frontal cortex in ADHD compared with typically developing children from age seven to age 12. And what's interesting here is that uh, this is consistent with the, the uh, clinical uh, presentation of children with ADHD, suppression of inappropriate responses, executive control of attention, evaluation of reward contingencies and higher order motor control. One area of the brain which showed uh, exaggerated cortical thickness at this time is shown here not surprisingly with ADHD uh, in the motor strip. We still have the same issues on the cortical surface of uh, spatial alignment and this shows um, an approach to look at uh, straight linear averaging across 152 subjects on the, on the left and after iterative alignment of uh, 
of uh, cortical features, basically a gradient-based approach that maximizes the overlap of uh, gradients across individual subjects. And you see uh, in this uh, graph from level zero to level five, increasing definition of cortical uh, gradient features and um, minimizing the variation across those gradients at any one location, you're getting more and more and more similar as, as the iterative uh, finite element mesh manipulation proceeds. And so in the end, this gives rise to um, an image like this. This is the same object viewed from six different views. And what it is showing you is the oscillation between the mean left hemisphere and the mean right hemisphere in brain. Um, I should point out that this uh, showing the difference between left and right hemisphere in the, in the area of the uh, uh, Sylvian fissure. Uh, this work was done manually in the, in the 80s by people like uh, uh, Galliburda and Gashwin doing uh, a hugely uh, uh, time consuming manual analysis. And this was uh, in, the, in the 90s and the 2000s, this was done essentially overnight by, uh, by an analysis of uh, extraction of cortical surfaces and the uh, comparison between the two. Now that's, uh, that shows very nicely the left and right difference. We can of course then quantify that by looking at uh, local surface area. And what you're seeing here is the same data, but this reveals the, the difference between left and right hemisphere cortical surface area. And you see that there's an increased surface area on the left in the Perry-Sylvian area and an increased surface area on the right in the occipital area, which uh, is consistent with what we know about the functional uh, specialization of the two hemispheres. Another major development in the 2000s was the, the, the rise of connectivity. And uh, we saw, uh, starting from uh, 1995, uh, when Barrett Biswell first uh, noticed that you could you could identify functional connectivity patterns in the resting brain, which was similar to those which you could obtain by direct stimulation, and so this gave rise to uh, uh, the whole uh, vast empire of uh, resting state functional MRI. On the bottom, you see uh, the demonstration of the default mode network, um, the uh, area of, of brain function, which wasn't clear to us at the time. And various people have associated this with uh, consciousness and uh, internal processing, internal representation. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, uh, in our lab, uh, Pierre Fizet in 1999 uh, looked at this directly using uh, uh, PET to examine subjects who are under varying levels of uh, profile sedation from uh, mild sedation to uh, complete, completely uh, under sedation. And you see here that the areas which show the greatest correlation with the degree of sedation, of, of degree of anesthesia, uh, shows really quite well the default mode network. So I think this is a clear demonstration that the DMN was in fact, is very much associated with consciousness. There are various types of connectivity and uh, I've just mentioned uh, the middle one, which is essentially correlation between brain regions. On the left here, you can of course have white matter connectivity and uh, ultimately giving rise to tractography, tractography which is the uh, direct mapping of, of uh, structural connections. On the right, you can also have the idea of correlations across subjects where we look at uh, cortical uh, correlation of uh, cortical thickness or uh, gray matter density or, or other structural variants ac across uh, individual subjects. So there are various ways to define connectivity. In the 2000s, we saw the arrival of uh, network theory. And this was originally uh, suggested by people like Watson Strogatz, where we can look at uh, networks in various various forms. It turned out that uh, most people see that uh, brains can be identified as small world, as in 
uh, a few, many local links, but a few long distance highways, which uh, provide shortcuts for uh, various parts of brain to connect with each other. Olaf spawns that I'll develop this in, in more widely into the uh, notion of the human connectome and Ed Bullmore and colleagues uh, show this, these applications can be, uh, network applications can be applied to gray matter, white matter, functional data, whether it's fMRI or electrophysiology. And all of them can give rise to uh, network models. And we saw an explosion of, of uh, graph metrics, which allow us to characterize the information flow across any brain network. Uh, a dizzying array, uh, something I think at, lot, at this last time about 60, 70 different metrics which capture um, properties of information flow across the brain. So this gave rise to the idea of uh, uh, functional activation and global hubs, areas where a lot of information is passing through these areas. They have high so-called betweenness centrality as an example. When we apply these approaches to the uh, structural anatomical covariance, uh, there are a variety of different strategies that can be used. In the end, what you're doing is, uh, if you break the brain into a set of ROIs, regions of interest, those can be used to uh, define a graph at the bottom. And we can apply all of the graph theoretical approaches to structural uh, uh, networks as well as functional networks. And it's gonna be done either in the volume on the left or surface-based vertex-wise analysis. We can apply these approaches to look at uh, brain disorders. So here you see an example of the uh, re reducing global efficiency uh, that's uh, observed as you have increasing amounts of white matter lesion load in MS. And global efficiency is effectively a measure of the, de the degree to which there are long range connections in the brain are functioning efficiently and white matter diseases like MS obviously interfere with the myelination of the long range connections and you can see the direct impact on uh, the global efficiency of the brain with increasing amounts of MS lesion load. We can uh, look into uh, more about networks of anatomical covariance by looking at this review article. So where are we going with all of this? Well, in increasingly we are swamped with all kinds of new information, whether it's structural or functional at different time scales. And increasingly we have to handle this with different levels of uh, tools, models for analysis, databases to store all this information. And we're increasingly dependent on large scale computing so resources to handle the amount of data that we can look at. Um, a nice review, uh, two years ago on the use of structural neuroimaging as a clinical predictor um, using machine learning strategies from uh, uh, Chema Mateus uh, Perez. And uh, the, the essential point here is that we need to use more and more information rather than just uh, any one single index, you know, flattening the feature vector so we can look at all of the above. It also note, notes that uh, continuous and binary classification uh, is, is, a, is a major distinction. I mean, a continuous classification is, is a much more realistic characterization of, of uh, human brain and brain disorders. I'll get a little bit in, into that in uh, slides to come. An example of using multiple uh, features to uh, in a machine learning context is from uh, Ming Li Zhang in, in, in my lab. She showed used uh, three different types of T1 weighted MRI and diffusion imaging to uh, predict brain age and uh, get a very good alignment between uh, predicted and observed brain age. One important dimension that I think we need to, we will be seeing more of and need to see more of is the temporal dimension when we're using these advanced strategies to uh, try and understand brain function. This is work from a young Herz group uh, describing the so-called chronectome, where we're looking at um, changes in dynamic functional connectivity across the brain as a function of, of time. 
So we can look at um, a sliding window that uh, runs along the fMRI time trace. And we can start to look at the relationship between uh, these dynamic functional connectivity maps and individual performance. And what you see here is that uh, the, the DFC dynamic, dynamic functional connectivity strength is, is associated with uh, fluid intelligence and the variability is associated with executive function and cognitive flexibility. And these are stable and remarkable, remarkable individual variability is captured with these uh, brain dynamics. They, got, they can identify individuals with, with high accuracy. And of course, this captures, captures the individual brain network dynamics, has, has huge implications for individualized characterization of health and disease. So these ideas uh, we, we've taken on board in, in recent years uh, within the McGill con uh, context, where we have the Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives initiative, which is a very large sprawling enterprise across about 100 investigators at McGill, all in, engaged in various forms of, uh, of um, brain research. Uh, the uh, underlying premise of, of uh, HBHL is uh, to eschew uh, disorder-based perspectives in, in favor of mechanism-based perspectives. Simply put, uh, genes don't code, code for diseases. And many genes uh, are found associated with many different disorders because of uh, so-called pleiotropy. Genes code more for specific mechanisms and specific pathways. And so it, we, the whole approach of HBHL is to focus more on mechanism and function and then identify the prevalence of specific aberrant mechanisms in particular clinical disorders. In fact, we start to think then of clinical disorders or indeed brain states in general as a weighted sum of aberrant quantifiable mechanisms. Good example of this is the work of uh, Yasser Ituria Medina, who has been using a uh, propagation modeling framework to uh, examine the propagation of the misfolded protein uh, amyloid, beta amyloid, across the brain in Al Alzheimer's disease. And this is very obviously a very appropriate topic uh, given what we are dealing with right now. It uses exactly the same uh, machinery as, as uh, pandemic propagation. Um, there are also agent-based approaches which do much the same kind of thing as, uh, as Aturia's uh, approach. This work is, is, is uh, motivated in part by the work of uh, Randy Buckner in the past, who showed that areas with high functional activation on the left also are areas which have high uh, accumulation of a beta as showed by the uh, PET tracer PIB. So the epidemic spreading model that Turi Medina developed uh, quantifies the change in prob probability of beta amyloid in any particular brain region as a consequence of increased accumulation into the area, into the region, and clearance of that, or perhaps do, uh, reduced clearance of that uh, A beta from any particular region, as well as the influence of various uh, external inputs, for instance, drugs. And we can characterize the accumulation of beta amyloid any, in any brain region by the production rate and the clearing rate. So this is in some sense a, a glorified PET compartmental modeling approach. So in, in the example that I'm showing you here, we took over 700 subjects looking at uh, beta amyloid, divided those up into a set of brain regions linked together by a brain network defined by the Carnegie Mellon uh, White Matter Atlas. And using the ESM model that I just mentioned, we can explore the parameter space, which identifies the optimal choice of those clearance and uh, production parameters, as well as age of onset across the entire population. And the results of this were uh, quite interesting. It showed that the uh, 
accumulation of beta amyloid across the brain was um, very much a function of distance from any uh, seeding epicenter. And so you have four different uh, levels of disease from healthy controls through to uh, full on Alzheimer's disease in the bottom right. And in each of those patient classes, you see uh, a pretty linear uh, uh, probability of uh, a beta accumulation depending on the distance from the, uh, from the local epicenter of disease propagation. What's most remarkable about this work is that it showed that uh, the accumulation of beta amyloid is a function more of production, uh, not, not of production, since there's not much change in the top left graph across the four categories. It's more a consequence of underclearance, as you see on the top right. And this has major ramifications for the design of drug intervention. On the bottom left, you can also see that the, uh, the production parameter doesn't change much with uh, gene status, APOE4 being the primary uh, risk factor for uh, developing Alzheimer's disease. On the other hand, on the bottom right, you see that uh, the clearance term is uh, very much dependent on uh, gene status. So this is, is consistent with the idea that uh, uh, a beta accumulation is a result of, uh, of uh, underclearance. In uh, 2018, Ituri Medina took this work uh, to a, a new level, incorporating not just a one uh, imaging metric, a beta, but uh, in this case, five or six imaging metrics, uh, looking at structure and function. And the ESM model was inverted so that uh, rather than seeing changes in biological factors as a consequence of, uh, uh, of inflow and outflow, we could invert that equation to ask the question, what external inputs would most achieve, best achieve the desired change in any one of these um, fact, biological factors, uh, a beta accumulation or tau accumulation or glucose metabolism and so on. And this al allows us the, the idea of uh, customizing therapeutic intervention to, to deal with the particular profile of the individual subject. And if you look on the top right, you look at the uh, uh, another uh, index of this of this uh, approach it shows that the uh, the gene expression predicted by just using cognition uh, MMSC as a clinical uh, memory test accounts for uh, a few percent of patient variability whereas this uh, uh, this personalized individual profile accounts for somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the individual variance across across subjects so we're moving towards the idea of a multifactorial characterization of individual brain states and optimization of, of uh, intervention using uh, control theory. It's not just about amyloid. Uh, we also, in the last 10 years, have seen a, a greater uh, prevalence of, uh, of um, uh, emphasis on tau protein as another misfolded protein, which may be more strongly associated with brain health and tracks better with cognitive status than does amyloid. Jake Vogel, a student in my lab, uh, basically used the same ESM approach to demonstrate that uh, uh, we can uh, match well, model well, the observed pattern of, uh, of tau distribution in brain using either structural or functional connectivity pathways. It also has gone on to use um, a machine learning approach uh, developed by uh, Alex Young at UCL, uh, which essentially takes a population of subjects and divides them up into subtypes and stages along those subtypes so that we can start to deal with individual variability across uh, the patient population. And what he showed is that of those subjects who have a significant abnormality accumulation of tau. You can split them into four subtypes, each with uh, somewhere between zero and 30 stages. And it turns out that those subtypes are found uh, preponderantly in different clinical subtypes. So you see uh, people with uh, uh, PCA, for instance, or L LPA, they have uh, different 
uh, representations of subgroups from, uh, uh, from this sustained uh, classification. On the bottom left, you see also that uh, these individual subtypes also have different epicenters, uh, different origins for the disorder, and you get better fitting between the observed and predicted propagation of tau if you uh, recognize the individual uh, subtypes. In fact, on the bottom right, if you take this into account, you might get, get a uh, significantly improved overall agreement between predicted and observed propagation patterns of tau. So this is a very explicit generative model, um, ESN, but it's taken advantage of, of uh, splitting the data into four subgroups using a machine learning approach, which didn't, didn't have any prior model. So it's a good example of the interplay between a machine learning approach for classification and a generative approach for interpretation. These, these uh, uh, strategies are applicable in uh, more than just Alzheimer's disease, of course, they are applicable in, in, in this uh, example for Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. The general approaches that I've just described are, are, are very, very broadly uh, usable in many different settings, not just neurodegeneration, but also in uh, neurodevelopment. So this does uh, bring us to the point where, how can we, uh, in, in, combine the best of classification and the best of the modeling approaches. The deep generative models are now beginning to appear. There's a combination of generative models and deep neural networks. But they have uh, the number of parameters is far less than the amount of data used to train them. And so the DGNs must discover the essence of the data in order to, to generate it. And there are various strategies being used, whether they're variational autoencoders or generative uh, adversarial, adversarial networks or to regressive models. They have the, therefore the potential to learn the natural features of a data set, whether they're categories or dimensions or something else entirely. But uh, we, I, I would ask the people in this audience to, uh, to explore how these approaches uh, differ from uh, uh, classical statistical decomposition approaches like PCA and ICA, which reduce the dimensionality of the problem. Briefly, I'll just mention that uh, to support all of this work, uh, one has to uh, get access to uh, major computational resources. And uh, we're using the Seabrain platform across the country, which has 400,000 processors. Um, I should note that it also uh, is open to uh, international partners. So you see on the bottom right that the Texas Advanced Computing Center is also a, a node on the Seabrain network. Seabrain supports over a, a thousand users in 30 different countries and uh, I invite people who would like to learn more about Seabrain to contact us and, or go onto the Seabrain website to, to log in. One of the partners that Seabrain supports is the so-called Helmholtz International Big Brain Analytics and Learning Laboratory and some of the work that I've been describing has, uh, has a significant relevant relevance within the, the Highball uh, project. Highball is based uh, around the big brain data set, which is a 3D uh, MRI, uh, sorry, 3D cytology histology uh, data set that was uh, developed over the last uh, 10, 20 years in uh, my colleague's lab in Ulish and the analysis done in my lab. It's equivalent of, uh, of 125,000 MRIs in volume. And you can see here an example of work that was done by our colleagues at uh, Western University, uh, Jordan de Cracker and Ali Khan, showing the segmentation of the hippocampus. And I, I show you on the bottom right the result of that segmentation. Uh, beautiful seg segmentation of the hippocampal subfields. So in Highball, uh, a major part of the of the activity is uh, advanced segmentation. Uh, some of it uh, AI-based segmentation. An example I just showed you was the the hippocampal subfield segmentation. 
but you can also look at the cortical layers in the in the uh, in the big brain. And this work is being done by uh, Conrad Wagstill uh, uh, in partnership with uh, Hannah Spitzer and Unish, and this uses a one-dimensional convolutional neural network approach to identify. Uh, the individual cortical layers, and you can see on the bottom right the salience maps, which show you the features which the uh, the one uh, B CNN is picking up in different cortical uh, areas. So this work allowed us to extract uh, in a fully automated manner all six layers of the human cortex in the big brain data set. And on the right, you can see the validation between. Uh, manual segmentation of some of these brain areas in shade in shaded gray compared to where the uh, the uh, AI approach the uh, deep learning approach that Wagstill is using um, has achieved uh, this, the individual cortical layers well this work has been uh, done in close association with uh, colleagues in uh, Yoshio Bengio's lab and at uh, Mila I think this is a very nice demonstration of the interaction between uh, machine learning uh, approaches and uh, neuroscience perspectives. Another part of the work that uh, is going on within Highball is the integration of uh, various kinds of information, structural, functional, chemo architectural. And you see here that we're building three dimensional maps of the distribution of uh, different receptors in brain. And this information combined with things like uh, polarized light imaging which gives us a, a, a spectacular perspectives on on um, uh, white matter pathways all of this information can be gathered together within one framework that you you may can think of as uh, google earth or google brain and uh, all of this information will then be amenable for uh, advanced machine learning analysis uh, two approaches that uh, are going on within Highball, which are complementary. One is the, the use of, of uh, this information that I just described within the context of the existing virtual brain approach from Randy McIntosh and Petra Ritter and uh, uh, Victor Yeza. Uh, the virtual brain is essentially based around uh, connections between brain regions, macroscopic brain regions. The virtual big brain will allow us to incorporate the layer information that I just described and the uh, chemo architectural information that I just described as well as neural mass models to uh, move to a higher level of spatiotemporal specificity in the virtual big brain. We're also uh, working closely be between uh, my lab and uh, our colleagues at Mila, uh, Blake Richards, Stoyner Precup, to explore brain-inspired artificial intelligence. Well, there's a, we're not so much talking here about image processing and segmentation, but modeling how the brain functions. We had a recent workshop here in uh, Montreal uh, for, as part of the human brain mapping conference that is still going on that uh, brought uh, together a number of speakers talking about um, the use of uh, uh, AI to understand brain function uh, Blake Richards's group are looking at uh, representational similarity matrices to, and uh, what is called contrastive predictive coding to understand how different uh, cell populations might uh, give rise to different response functions uh, uh, under external stimulus. And what they've already shown in rodent models is uh, uh, lateral and medial pathways in, in uh, different brain areas which uh, give rise to differential responses. And although this is right now uh, electrophysiological in rodents, uh, the potential of this to be applied directly on, for instance, fMRI data in humans is, is, is very much part of the highball premise. Uh, I could not not mention the beautiful work of uh, Anna Shapiro's group looking at uh, uh, the hippocampal formation and showing that there are at least two different learning systems uh, uh, can be identified using a, a machine learning approach uh, to identify uh, localist responses where one can identify uh, and categorize uh, specific examples of, of uh, individual cases. And these have, have to be complemented by a, a slower uh, generalized generalization 
function which allows one to identify new cases which haven't been seen before, but identify them uh, as uh, being uh, concordant with previous categorization. And so therefore you can start to generalize out from uh, existing prior knowledge. So I've covered a lot of territory, but uh, where are we going in terms of uh, uh, brain mapping for the future? Well, we still need a lot of network analysis with uh, multiple modalities. And we're still exploring connectivity met metrics and looking at the relationship between, uh, between those connectivity matrix metrics and behavioral and clinical indices. The relationship between connectivity and genotype is, is, uh, is uh, exploding. We have to focus on the dynamic changes in brain state. I think uh, this is really uh, um, a hugely important area to, to uh, continue to explore. Of course, we're looking at a continued downward extension at the, the uh, spatial temporal scale. And we're looking at multivariate trajectory analysis of the kind that I described with uh, Yasser Aturia Medina's work. We're looking to better uh, combine generative models and machine learning classification to give us interpretable uh, predictions and, and modelization of uh, brain function. We need to customize more and more to individuals and understand how the brain works using uh, brain inspired AI. And of course, all of this is dependent upon uh, the globalization of our brain mapping infrastructure. With that said, I'd like to thank uh, a very large number of people who uh, contributed to this work and who I'm delighted to be continuing to work with. Thank you very much.